All right, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And uh, let's jump in. So today I'm going to be presenting um, Beyond Black Boxes, teaching complex machine learning ideas through hands-on exercises in Netsbox. This was uh, worked on behalf of myself and Chuchi Grover, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, Derek Babb from University of Nebraska Omaha. So, um, basically at a high level, what we've been uh, working on is this project that's focused on teaching AI and machine learning from a cybersecurity standpoint. Um, but of course, we're going to focus on the AI and machine learning aspects for this talk. Then the main goal is to really develop intuition about fundamental machine learning concepts, uh, such as classification and optimization, through hands-on uh, activities and projects. So it's not just um, you know learning about vocabulary from a textbook or things like that. Now, we generally can categorize the activities that we have into three different um, broad categories, like interactive explorations and games. Um, some like scaffolded programming puzzles, which we're going to jump into uh, in a lot more detail and really focus on for the majority of this talk. But I really wanted to lay down some of this um, overarching context. And then we also have some web-based exploratory tools and things like that, where you can do things like uh, give it an image of a stop sign, um, make some subtle changes to it. So that it, although it looks barely any different to a person, um, uh, some of these standard computer uh, vision models would classify it with, as like a speed limit, 60 miles an hour sign or 120 kilometers an hour. Um, then uh, our programming activities were structured as Parsons problems where we would basically introduce and discover the algorithm, um, usually uh, and then outline it at a high level, but then jump into some high level Parsons problem and then optionally implement some low level details. But uh, so with this kind of uh, context or framing, Let's jump into a little bit of background knowledge and then, and then the uh, most interesting part, which is the projects themselves or a few example projects themselves. So for a little bit of background, um, this is all done in Netsbox. If you haven't heard of Netsbox, it's a SNAP extension that's designed to make advanced computing concepts more accessible to novices. Uh, initially it was designed focusing on uh, distributed computing. Um, and as such, the primary I guess uh, differences or the main differences from uh, SNAP are in the introduction of two different networking abstractions, remote procedure calls shown in this bottom block where you can do things like interact with third party web APIs or do all sorts of other things like use cloud variables and such. Um, and uh, um, well, and such as, as one more example, you know, you can do things like uh, get sensor data from your phone and use your phone as a sensor. You could interact with physical robots and use it to control robots. You can store and save and read cloud variables, like interact with real world um, data sets like climate data and COVID data and things like that. Uh, another abstraction, so all that is possible through this remote procedure called block. Another abstraction is this uh, is message passing. So we introduce a couple blocks. The main two one, the, the like kind of main ones that people are usually using are the top two here where you define some type of message. Um, like, a, like in this case, we defined a location message, which we said has two fields, latitude and longitude. And then this block, which dynamically updates depending upon the type of message you're sending, uh, can be used to send messages over the internet to other uh, instances of Netsblock. So these might be running on different computers or in different classrooms or different countries or, or anywhere. Uh, and um, the hat block above it, this one I receive location would be then how you can actually listen and, and implement some message handler for a, a given type of message. So I already alluded to some of these different features and stuff that, that, uh, that Netsbox has or some of these different capabilities that it exposes through these two abstractions. But, um, but as I mentioned, you can make cloud variables, you can create Alexa skills, you can program your Alexa from, from the browser. Um, including sending uh, sending blocks to basically implement the skill or to run on the server in the cloud um, and uh, and be used by your Alexa device. We uh, and, and of course we have uh, robotics, physical as well as virtual, which were motivated largely by um, some of these uh, constraints introduced by COVID. Uh, we have phone as a sensor, undo collaborative editing. You can even implement auto graders, um, which we have a workshop for tomorrow if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. 
So now let's jump into um, really the, the core content of this talk, which is really teaching this AI and machine learning in Nets blocks. So really the core idea when we're trying, like that, our core, I guess, motivation or um, hope was that we could teach AI and machine learning concepts in a way that kind of lifts the hood and allows the students to interact more deeply with these uh, underlying algorithms and models. And this is really the core piece that we're hoping will help the students develop um, some intuition about some of these fundamental concepts. In some ways, you can see some similarities with um, uh, the turtle geometry in the ways that like really being able to, in, in some senses, embody aspects of these, these fundamental concepts um, can help them, uh, it, can, it can help them really gain, um, gain a deeper understanding and be able to just really engage engage with these sometimes complex concepts in a really rich way to like uh, to create projects and things like that that are meaningful to them. So let's jump into um, just a quick overview of the activities that we've been working on in this project and then I'll highlight a couple specific ones um, that we can hopefully cover during this this uh, this talk in, in detail. So uh, we have a number of activities. We have cryptography and coding as Caesar's cipher. We have some sprinkled in here around um, programming and, and some of these distributed computing ideas from Netsblocks, just because they're a bit of prerequisites for some of the later things and really can be used to motivate some of these cryptography, um, cryptography activities. So for example, like starting to build your first kind of chat or texting application between two different computers and then making it into a client server app. And then we, um, once we have this client server chat app, then we can start jumping into actually performing denial of service attacks and encrypting your messages and sharing them and, and start talking about topics, even like content moderation um, and introducing things like uh, concepts of classification and natural language processing and sentiment, sentiment analysis. And, uh, and then later we shift uh, into data exploration for uh, a little bit. Um, just before jumping into some uh, classification of some synthetic Twitter bot data, and then getting into um, even more involved examples, including adversarial examples and, and GANs. For this talk, I wanted to focus primarily on the Sentimental Writer app, or the activities for the Sentimental Writer project, registration bots and gradient descent, and then, um, and then GANs. So, Without further ado, let's jump in. So the first one here, the this is one project that's introduced um, or that's used as a as a relatively basic program. Uh, all the code is shown here in, on the left, but uh, but the idea is to introduce this, these ideas of sentiment analysis um, and uh, and classification as well as uh, like model confidence. So for example, in this case, what this program is actually doing, which if you've been um, looking closely at the code, you might already have an idea. But basically what this program is, is, uh, is a sort of typewriter. We could say, like, how are you today? But the fun little twist is that if you write something that has um, a very strong sentiment, like I love cats and snap, then it color codes it, uh, in this case, in blue. And, but if you wrote something like um, something that was pretty negative, like I hate Java <laughs> or something. Um, oh, I have a typo. I have Java. It makes sense why that would be neutral. But if you said something like I hate Java, then uh, then this would uh, be color coded in red. So this uh, this program is relatively simple, um, with the one exception of we do have a like a max by key block, which that one's given um, to the students already, and this is framed as a Parsons problem. I just jumped into the finished one, so we could start talking about it. But the nice thing about this is, with the exception of that block, a max again using um, using a key, which is pretty common in a lot of different um, uh, introductory programming languages like Python. But um, but a lot of the, the core part of this is really in this parallel dot service or this call block, which is which is calling this RPC. Now, um, just to jump dig into this one a little bit deeper to make it very clear what this is doing, these uh, call RPC blocks are um, 
they group all of your RPCs into services. So like if we go under um, artificial intelligence category, we can see parallel dots this year. And we could always right click and check out the help menu and see that in this case, this is you know using the parallel dots, um, uses the parallel dots AI um, API through to, uh, to perform this sort of text analysis. And if we have more questions, we can always click and find a lot of documentation on this parallel dot service that's exposed in Netsbox. So this is um, fleshed out a bit, including some just fundamentals and things, but there's documentation on most of the services and RPCs. Uh, and then once we, um, so, but if we look at the specific RPC we were using, which was just the sentiment analysis one, although we could also use detecting abusive text, which we generally do when we talk about um, content moderation and things like that. But we uh, we can check out this get sentiment RPC and let's see message was set to I hate Java. So if we call this, we can see that we get a little table back that says um, the confidence um, that this was negative, neutral, or positive. That was returned from the API. So the nice thing about this is that students can really engage with. Um, like in the past, we've also used this in slightly different contexts where where students are learning about text analysis in the context of, in our case, it was actually looking at historical documents. And uh, historical text can read a little bit different from modern day text, which I believe this model was trained on Reddit. So this gave us a nice little interface for, or a nice activity where we first introduced some of these basic programming concepts for students who in that context were coming from the humanities. Um, and then well, once we actually created the program, they, uh, they were able to interact and try to probe the model and see what it was sensitive to. Um, like, uh, like, see if you can see if it's sensitive to adding, you know, um, dots. And we can see that now I was able to fool this model, but just adding periods between most of the letters, though any person would be able to understand that. So this leads nicely into conversations, not only about classification, but also um, Kind of trying to probe into the model and ask questions about why do we think the model per performed the way that it did and um and the relationship really between the training data set and the output of the model so um things that might be sensitive to etc all right so i spent maybe a little more time than i was expecting to on that one but we should still have enough time to cover the rest so um Introducing these concepts like classification and natural language processing and model confidence was this activity. Now, one of the things we start digging into a little bit deeper is we actually try to, again, lift the hood and actually expose concepts like optimization and gradient descent. And the first activity we have to do this is one that um, where the student is playing this game where they are essentially embodying an optimizer. So it says that this, this little, um, Polar bear, if you didn't catch that while I was talking, says there's an invisible function here and we need to find the minimum. So this is basically what the computer is trying to do um, when you're trying to um, train some or find the, the best parameters for some machine learning model. So we start somewhere and we can see that it looks like that this is where this point is and it's pointing to the left. So I'll keep going left. Oh, now I need to go right. Oh, there we go. Found the model or found the, sorry, found the minimum of this this model and then I can hit space and then move on to the next um, the next function and uh, and I can start kind of continuing down this this route so it takes a, a second for it to um, it, it pre-computes everything so it takes a second for uh, for it to be ready but but now we're playing this again and if I just try to pick before well I actually did hit a minimum but it said it wasn't the minimum, the global minimum. Oh, there we go. So this was this function. And I can just kind of continue, continue trying things like this. So we can kind of incrementally introduce this idea of optimizing and local minimum uh, or minima and, uh, and kind of continuing down this route. But the nice thing about this activity and one of the things I, I like about it in particular is that um, it's a it's really a hands on interactive where students can uh, try to solve the same problem that <laughs> yeah, this one is um, tricky. Um, anyway, where, where students can start exploring these uh, the really embodying this this optimizer and then we can act in a in the context of a function that doesn't yet have any meaning. 
So at one second, if I try to find the minimum here, so this one was a little trickier. Um, so the nice thing about this is that once we've gone through this activity with a few functions, we could say, well, what would what would it even mean for this to be the minimum? Like what would what would the minimum represent if our y-axis or the height here was say like uh, uh, ticket prices for a Taylor Swift concert? And the x-axis was the number of days before the ticket or before uh, the concert that you're buying the ticket. So in this case, finding the minimum would be finding the cheapest ticket or when to buy really your, your ticket. Um, then you could ask you know, similar questions like that where it's very concrete and then take it one step more abstracted and say, well, what if actually the y-axis here was the error of a machine learning model? So we had some model that was that was um, that uh, th that this this function represents the error, or at least the y value does, and the x-axis is something that we could we could configure. So, in other words, if there is something that we could tweak or change to make this model more or less accurate, and the y value is how accurate it is, then you could then uh, then finding the minimum would really be trying to find the the best parameters for a model or or the best model that we have. And this is essentially model training. Okay, so um, now in this, for the sake of time, I'm actually probably gonna skip this uh, registration bot detection um, activity. We have a few different slides, essentially at a high level. What, what happens is students are given this simple website, basically built within Snap and they can you know, sign up or pretend to sign, register for these accounts. Then they can write a little bot, basically, that uh, or a little sprite that goes through and fills out the fields for them. So then we can actually collect bot data from within that box, and uh, and all the data can be shared via cloud variables. So then we can actually train a model that, given if we take the say average speed and duration of this of the sign up, we can actually predict reasonably well most of the time <laughs> um, if it's a human or a, a bot. For the In the context of the classroom, we just fix those data sets um, to a snapshot just so it'd be predictable for the teachers who are teaching, but, but you can certainly um, connect to the live data set and stuff as well. Now the last um, project that I'm going to be showing a quick um, example of is, so this one is a, um, I'm, is a, an example or a simple example of really GANs. I mean, technically it's not using neural networks. It's uh, because the uh, discriminator isn't a neural network. It's a different type of uh, classifier, but, um, but it's still performing the same um, GAN-like setup. Um, maybe we could just call it a GAM, generative adversarial models, <laughs> even if the models aren't necessarily neural networks. But the idea here is that basically we basically we first introduce the concept of generators and discriminators, and then we can have this example of it working and talk about the algorithm at a high level. And then we have a, a scaffolded out one that's a Parsons problem where they can either just do the sub goal kind of programming or just the high level steps, um, or they can do that and then continue on to um, actually implementing each of these, these sub goals or high level steps. So in this case, in, and this is the completed project where we, um, we have some real data, which is these green points, and we have some fake data, which is these red points. And we have this circle, which is trying to circle green points and not red points. So it circles the data that it thinks is real. Now, the, it's in the case of GANs, um, and now you can see that the circle is moving because we're training the discriminator or the thing to try to discriminate between real and fake. And then, uh, and then we'll alternate between training the discriminator and generator until we end up with um, red points that are quite close um, to, the, to the green points. So this is a really a stripped down version of GANs, um, another in the sense that uh, we simplified the machine learning models that are used and, we, um, and we're not generating like, you know, high dimensional <laughs> data or not generating images or videos or something wild like that. But we can at least distill it down to the fundamental concepts um, and do it in an environment where the students can actually implement or, or compose the sub goals and then implement the, the actual uh, training algorithm. So, um, 
So this is really the kind of the, the goals here. And then we would move to some web-based editor um, where they can actually you know, play around with GANs in the browser, um, but they can't see the code because it's much more complex. So with that, I'm gonna hop back. Um, you can see that, uh, that the discriminator guides the generator or the circle is kind of guiding the red points as it moves towards the green points. So the red points end up getting closer and closer to the, to the green points. So with that, I would like to um, share that we have a few resources. I'm gonna post these, uh, or I'll share a link to these slides um, that you can check out if you have any more questions or, or things like that. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and open it up for any questions now. And sorry for 30 seconds over. <laughs>